Greetings, this is Purple Target, and welcome to my tutorial Let's Play KSP series Crash Test Kerbals, Episode 1 TAC 5. Have you had your K8 today? Currently using Kerbal Space Program version 0.19.1. At Crash and Learn, we explore just enough rocket science to be dangerous and learn how to abuse math instead of the other way around to get our Kerbal knots out to the depths of space more or less where we want them for fun and profit, as opposed to just letting them walk sideways all day. For today's objectives, we're going to look at inclination changes, both how to calculate them and how to avoid them. So many transfer orbits will be around the equator to maximize the speed bonuses, and it makes transfer windows much easier. But we saw how low inclinations are really limiting on the ground that we pass over. So for scanning operations, high altitude comms, or navsats, we need to know how to get into a polar orbit. Now, rotation to this point has been mentioned, but it's not overly apparent in equatorial launches so we'll revisit why planetary rotation is an important factor to consider. That'll lead us to looking at the heading that we launch at in order to get the inclination that we want, instead of just launching and praying that it'll magically happen. And of course, as promised, for when there's no other choice, we'll look at a couple ways to calculate and plan inclination changes, including why the maneuver nodes will lie to you, and how to do an inclination burn without nodes or math. Well, much math. And we'll end up putting all the above together to put a satellite into a direct entry orbit without all the mucking about in the parking lot. And finally, the rules to live and crash by, and we'll review any little tidbits that'll make life easier for us in the future. We'll jump right into our first attempt at a polar orbit in the fashion that I tend to see a lot of folks do. They want a northerly orbit, so they launch north, and then adjust from there. I'm only going to cover a couple formulas today, but I'm going to touch on several different ways to solve or view a problem at once. So there's going to be a lot of scary looking numbers with funny Greek symbols. Don't worry though, they'll often be repeated and just shown in a slightly different way to hammer the concepts. They'll also be accompanied by plenty of arrows pointing all over the place making various triangles and other pretty pictures. So buckle up and put your helmets on, it's time to learn about inclinations and azimuths by fire hose. Ready, set drink. We can see here the stats for the Garnet Mark II Alpha, which has just replaced the LVT engine in the insertion stage with a lighter and more efficient 909 engine. And on top is a slightly lighter LKO sat with enough delta V for an LKO orbit out to 450 kilometers. Go for stage. So, welcome to the maneuvering board. This is an awesome and quick calculator that doesn't slice or dice or do Julian fries, but it does do some trigonometry quite well, specifically when dealing with distances, velocity vectors, and angles. Rather than formulas or numbers, this calculator works with compass or dividers, a parallel or ruling ruler, and a pencil. It's excellent for getting ballpark answers to things like relative velocity questions in a few seconds. I plan to use this frequently because when I'm showing you how to calculate an answer with a formula, I can also show the pretty pictures about what the equations mean. And showing you how to draw the picture shows you how to draw and measure the answer on the maneuvering board at the same time. And of course I'm not going to show you a tool that you can't use too. The board is available online, complete with an instruction book of all kinds of problems that it can solve in its natural environment, which unfortunately is not orbital mechanics, but we can adapt it for some of the simple problems. I'll leave a link to it in the video description, or you can search on your favorite engine for maneuvering board and relative velocity to find a multitude of similar products. Nico. So first thing I'll do is prep the board, and I'm interested in marking out my target orbital velocity for my standard 80 kilometer parking orbit as we discussed in previous episode. So that's going to be 2,279 meters per second. So first thing I need to do is choose a scale, and we want the best scale that our numbers will fit on. So in this case I'll use 3 to 1, which means each ring will be equal to 300 meters per second. Using dividers I'll measure off to 22.79, or as close as I can get on that scale. And as I said, this is a ballpark tool, not precision. Next, I'll transfer that velocity to the board. 
and I'll make a circle at that radius. Inserting. So anything from the middle to the circle represents a velocity of 2279 meters per second, with the vector being represented by the angle of the line around the 360 degree compass rows. So for this example, the rocket is doing its turn on a heading of 000, so let's put in the velocity vector in yellow. But what we see in orbit is that we're not getting 000. The prograde is a few degrees off, around 004. And indeed, our inclination isn't 90 degrees either, like we might want. More like 86 degrees. So what happened? Well, the rotation of Kerbin happened. It was mentioned in a previous episode briefly that Kerbin is rotating at 174.5 meters per second at the equator. So while a spacecraft on the launch pad has a surface speed of zero, the orbital speed is already 175 meters per second to the east, even before the clamps let go. So we can measure that off and place it on the board. And we adjust it for the end of the yellow vector that the rocket drove, and it matches up nicely with the green vector that we actually ended up with. So how do we fix that? Well, launch 004 is already in orbit, so we'll need to do an inclination change in order to fix that a little later. In the meantime, we'll reset the board to try again for launch 005, which is going to be launched directly into a 90 degree inclination right from the launch pad, and with a right ascension of the ascending node at about 60 degrees offset from the previous launch. Now that latter part we just need to wait for about an hour for Kerbin to rotate that far around, and we can use our Kiosat 1 from the previous episode as a guide to the timing. This time we'll start with our target vector in green at 90 degrees from the equator. Then we put in the rotation vector. We can work from there, but it'd be easier to visualize the whole thing if we shift the rotation vector in blue up to meet the target vector. And that allows us to lay out our spacecraft vector. If we look at the extension of the spacecraft vector all the way to the edge, we can find the heading we need, around 354. Keep in mind these lines are all really thick and fuzzy. If you do the same on paper, I recommend a sharp pencil. Not too sharp though, you don't want to cut the paper. So while Launch 005 finishes getting itself into the parking orbit, we'll run through a full example of how to calculate the launch heading required for a target inclination. So the rotation at Kerbin at the equator is 174.5 meters per second. For any planet, it's basically the circumference of the equator divided by the sidereal period, or however long a day is for that planet. If all else fails and you don't want to do the math, you can always look it up on the wiki. It's not that we're close to the orbital speed, we can see the prograde on the desired heading of 000 so we can burn straight for the prograde rather than our offset heading. Now the following isn't an issue for launches from the Kerbal Space Center, but notionally if you're launching from anywhere that's not the equator, the rotational speed depends on the latitude, as the circumference at higher latitudes gets smaller, and therefore so does the velocity of the ground relative to space. And that's given by the cosine of the latitude. So at 60 degrees north or south, the cosine is one half, so the rotational velocity will be one half of that on the equator. We'll see this again in the equations, but you can mostly ignore it for any KSC launches. So the next thing is trying to get into the right inclination, which as we know from episode 1 TAC 4, is measured from the equatorial plane. Now we're usually going to be on the equator, in which case this next formula is also mostly pointless. However, the azimuth that a rocket needs to follow for a given inclination changes depending on the latitude of the launch site. So we need this formula which shows the azimuth equals the arc sine of the quotient of the cosine of the inclination over the cosine of the latitude. Now the launch azimuth is an angle measured from the poles that we need for a given inclination. From the equator, the divisor equals 1, and the arc sine of the cosine of the inclination is just going to be the difference between 90 and the inclination anyways. 
So really most of the time you can just do simple subtractions as you can see from the diagram. However, as you can see here, if the latitude was up at 60 degrees north, then the azimuth would be 90 degrees in order to get that 30 degree inclination. This again shows why the minimum inclination is going to be the same as the launch site latitude, as we learned about in previous episodes. Anyways, again, know that the equation is here for when you deal with non-equatorial launches and landings. Anyways, now that we have an azimuth, it can be translated into a heading, which is pretty simple for the northern direction. However, any azimuth will also have a southern heading as well, which you can use for inserting into an orbit around the descending node, whereas northerly launches will be around the ascending node. So a completely pointless example that we're not going to fly, but with all the colorful arrows that I promised, we'll run through the math. As usual, we have a latitude of zero for an equatorial position of the Kerbal Space Center. Add in the rotation of the planet based on the latitude. Our target inclination is going to be 30 degrees. So we find out the orbital azimuth that we want to target based on our 30 degree inclination and zero degree latitude, so we get an azimuth of 60. And that's the final vector we want to end up with for our parking orbit at 2279 meters per second. So we can break down the vector into the x and y axis in green and turquoise to see what numbers we're missing. So the y portion we need is the orbital velocity VO times the cosine of the azimuth for 1139 meters per second. And the sine of the azimuth times VO will give us the x portion that we need. And we can easily see that by subtracting the rotational velocity from the yellow x factor will give us the remaining x portion we need for the rotational azimuth. The y portion remains the same for both rotational and orbital. So if we put all these arrows and steps together to find the rotational azimuth in red, we end up with this equation. The arctangent of the rotational x over the rotational y, and as we said, the y at the bottom doesn't change, and the rotational x at top is the difference between the orbital x factor and the rotational velocity of the launch site. So, plugging in all our numbers into the formula, we can see that the rotational azimuth is just shy of 58 degrees instead of 60. And coincidentally with Pythags, we can see the horizontal speed requirement is only 2130. If we measure it off, we might get something a little different, like the 2070 we see on the scale here. Still, it's pretty close to the calculated value. So that's about all of it. A few quick equations that can take you from a launch site at any latitude direct to any available inclined orbit without those pesky and expensive inclination changes once you're up. This should get you within a couple of degrees, so the corrections to fix your orbit should be minimal, and you can save your delta-v budget for real stuff. And did I mention that the maneuvering boards are really good at trig? Instead of all the little calculations, we could have gotten our basic answer with these three lines, and just rolling off the heading of the red line could have been done in about 10 seconds. Now that we got a moment, Launch 004 can do its inclination correction. So we can compare the different approaches by taking the baseline fuel state at main engine cutoff for launches 4 and 5 once they got to a stable parking orbit, and then measure it again after all the corrections were made to get to the proper inclination and right ascension of the ascending node for the parking orbit immediately before it started the transfer. And we can see that launch 004, which had to correct about 4.5 degrees, used almost twice as much delta V as launch 005, which went direct into the intended inclination. So there is a point to doing this kind of planning. So KSC is going to carry on with putting LKO Sat 1 and 2 into their proper orbits. So here I'm using KioSat 1 to measure the angle between the RAN of LKO 1 on the left and the RAN for Minimus on the right. And since we know that KioSat 1 is orbiting at 1 degree per minute, we can use the time difference between the nodes, which happens to be about 1 minute, to realize that in order to adjust the RAN we need to torque the orbit of LKO 1 about 1 degree counterclockwise. 
And so we can do that at LK01 by setting a node, in this case at the south pole, measure the angle change that we have against LK02. Going to jump back and forth here a bit with space oddities and orbital maneuvers. Now timing the transfers is pretty straightforward. We can mostly just do that with the nodes by making sure that the time to the new apoapsis ties in with the time that we're expecting our Kiosat 1 to arrive at the corresponding ascending or descending node. So our space oddities are rules to live and crash by. If we're just doing a small inclination change, then we can just do a direct burn to make that inclination happen. If, on the other hand, our inclination change is over 60 degrees, then we'll generally get some savings by doing a large apoapsis change and then doing the inclination out at the apoapsis. If we're using one of these large changes, don't circularize. We don't need to add any more energy into the orbit than absolutely necessary. In three, two, one, For changes less than 40 degrees, we can use the clock rule to estimate our delta V. So a change of 15 degrees would be one quarter of whatever our orbital velocity is. The heading that we want for our inclination change is 90 degrees off of our half angle for the inclination change. Or we can go to the normal or anti-normal and go that half angle towards the retrograde and get the same number. And if you're just going to freehand your inclination change, then note the starting velocity and burn until it returns to that same velocity. And lastly, don't rush. You can always take a note of the speeds and the angles on one pass around the orbit and then wait until you come around a second time to actually conduct the burn. This might be a good time to mention it's okay to be OCD and precise about the position and size of your orbit when you're getting to the final position of your spacecraft. But for parking orbits and transfers, who cares? Don't waste your time in delta V getting perfect circles or anything like that. An 80 by 80 is no different than a 75 by 95. You're not going to be there long enough for it to matter. Just make sure you're not scraping Atmo and carry on with your program. Now that the final orbit has all been fine-tuned, we can go ahead and deploy the comms gear for LKOSAT-1. That said, as you'll see, proper inclination changes involve some retrograde movement and loss of altitude. So once you do start your burn, you want to burn smartly and directly back to your target velocity. I'm not going to bother going over the same thing with LKOSAT2 because it's really just more of the same. It is worth noting, however, that the intersects for these satellites is a CPA of about 12 kilometers, which is actually a little less than what the Cosmos and Iridium 33 had when they T-boned each other in space a few years back. And there's an AGI video for that on one of my playlists. So the final result is LKO SAT 1 and 2 in 1 hour LKO orbits, synced up to pass through their descending node across the equator at the same time that KioSat 1 crosses their orbit. Go for stage. F pitch over. Go for stage. Nico. Insertion complete. Okay, so let's take a closer look at inclination changes, and with Launch 006, we'll run a couple of tests to see how this can be done. So, starting with an equatorial orbit, and the reciprocal retrograde, and we'll mark for reference the normal and anti-normal, which are always at 90 degrees to the prograde or retrograde headings on the horizon. 
So when we pull the normal node to change our inclination, it calculates thrust in that one direction, 90 degrees left of our starting prograde, in this case straight north. And just a twitch on the node will always show you where the normal direction is by placing a maneuver node marker on the nav ball. So we need to keep pulling on the normal node until we get a 30 degree inclination. So we can take that north heading and roll it off to the end of our current vector in green and extend it up to the 30 degree inclination to get our yellow maneuver vector. And then the combination of these two vectors will produce our resulting vector in red, which is the velocity vector we'll have after the burn. We can measure off the estimated delta V for the burn by the length of the yellow burn vector. And measure off the scale for approximately 1300 meters per second. Just to compare our calculations against KSP, this maneuver was 1323 meters per second according to the node. And we can also take a look at the length of our final vector. Measuring off, we'll find out that we also speed up from 2279 meters per second to around 2650 meters per second. Which, with some other formulas that I'm not going to show today, we would find out that when we're at our maneuver node and an 80 kilometer parking orbit, gaining velocity to 2650 meters per second will push out our apoapsis to around 820 kilometers. That's not really what we're looking for, because now we'd have to spend additional delta V trying to adjust our AP back down. The actual apoapsis on this maneuver was 813 kilometers. So again, math wins, and like I said, the nodes will lie to you. So let's try again and find a more direct and efficient way to conduct the maneuver. So this time we'll put our target vector only as long as our 80 kilometer orbital velocity. We only want to change the inclination by 30 degrees, not the size of the orbit. And then when we connect the dots with the rocket's vector in yellow to get from where we are to where we want to be, we can roll off that angle, which is why we have a parallel or rolling ruler to transfer lines around the board without losing their angles. And we measure off the heading that the rocket needs to steer. And we get a heading of 345, vice straight north. And we can measure the length of the spacecraft vector to get the delta V of the maneuver. At around 1225 meters per second. Your answers may vary depending on how dull your pencil is. Now notice that our maneuver is pointed slightly retrograde, so the burn is going to slow us down and our net velocity vector as the inclination is changing is going to stay along the yellow line. So we can measure the minimum velocity we reach in blue. And that way we find out that at the halfway mark we'll slow down to 2200 meters per second before starting to speed back up again. So we can execute our maneuver just like this, knowing our heading needs to be 345 and that we need to burn from 2279 meters per second We'll get down to about 2200 meters per second and then keep going till our speed is back up to 2279 meters per second again. Remember our normal is always on the horizon, although in this case we might burn slightly above the horizon just to make up for some of the altitude we're going to lose while we're going slower than the orbital velocity. So just with eyeballing, we've gotten the inclination that we wanted, and we've gone from 75 by 82 kilometer orbit to 78 by 90, which is still pretty close to what we started with. And if you were paying attention to our minimum speed slightly before we drew the estimate of 2200 on the maneuvering board, the actual was 2194 meters per second. Close enough for government work.
Now we can calculate the more precise answer using a formula and while we're at it we'll run through a third test but this time with the maneuver nodes we'll use a combination of the normal for the inclination changes as well as some retrograde in order to control the shape of our final orbit and keep it from pushing the apoapsis out. Although looking at the formula we can use the clock rule for some cases where our inclination is less than 40 degrees. The clock rule is a quick way of estimating the sine of something because for angles less than 40 degrees the sine is roughly equal to that angle divided by 60 which is how many minutes are in a clock. So our angle being 30, think 30 minutes is half an hour or half of 60 so we would estimate the maneuver as requiring one half of our orbital velocity of 2279 which is around 1140 meters per second. And that's only 85 less than the estimate that we measured off. Now from the pretty pictures we can see how this formula works because it splits our vector triangle into two equivalent right angle triangles which is a requirement for trig functions like sine. So the inclination angle is split in half and that sine of the smaller angle is taken and applied to the velocity of the hypotenuse in green and that gives us half of the yellow. So it needs to be doubled again which is where the 2 in front of the V comes from. Also note that the heading of 345 is 90 degrees off that half inclination angle. So knowing that half angle and 90 degrees you should be able to measure off the heading from your prograde for any inclination change. And with the clock rule, you should be able to look at your current velocity and estimate the delta V for most smaller inclination changes under 40 degrees. So if we plug in 30 for the inclination and the orbital velocity for V, we get the refined calculated and optimally correct value of 1180 meters per second which is funny enough right between our measured thick pencil line method and the quick head cheese math estimate. So running our combined maneuver node we can notice that the delta V at once is 1192 meters per second which is pretty close to what we were estimating and uh, lo and behold the maneuver heading is on 345. Isn't that weird? We'll let launch 006 come down. So wash, rinse, and repeat. This time we're pretty much going to skip the parking orbit and show a direct insertion into a target orbit from launch. For launch 007, we're going to launch a beacon satellite into an LKO orbit with a two hour period, and we want it to be in parallel with Minimus. So the RAN and inclination should be about the same as the target moon. So our target vector is at a six degree inclination or an azimuth of 084. And for the RAN, we're just going to time our launch so it's close to that of Minimus, which is also marked by LKO Sat 1. Now I'm going to keep the parking orbit velocity just because I'm planning on passing through this point on the way up. So once the inclination is at the right azimuth, I can start burning straight at the prograde to do any further adjustments to the orbit. We add in the rotation of Kerbin, move the rotation vector up to meet the target, Go for stage. and lay down the rocket's heading to match the two vectors. And we can see the very minor shift from the orbital azimuth of 084 to a rotational or launch azimuth of 083. And as we can see, this ties in nicely with the equations if we plug in everything for that. So gravity turn will be on a heading of 083-ish. <laughs> 
So at this point all the math is done, we got in our back pocket and we can just concentrate on flying the program. And as our orbital speed is approaching 2200 meters per second, we can already see that our inclination is at 6.2 degrees. So we can switch off from our rotational azimuth heading of 083 and go direct at the prograde on our orbital azimuth of 084 as we carry on into our transfer orbits because we don't need to adjust our inclination any further. We seem to have timed our launch correctly as the ascending node on the target with Kiosat 1 is right in line with the LKO-1 marker, which as you remember was lined up with the RAN for Minimus. So as I said before, Launch 007 is going to do a direct orbital insertion for BeaconSat-1. So we're going to push our apoapsis all the way out to our target altitude of 1067 kilometers. And coincidentally we can also see that our inclination is correct at about 6 degrees, so it seems our azimuth burns worked fairly well. And this is why I like the math, because a little bit of preparation and calculation ahead of time gives us the numbers that we can check during our flight to figure out if we're going to end up where we planned. And if we understand how we got the numbers, then it's pretty easy to figure out how to adjust our flight in order to get back to the plan when things are going sideways. And the stats for the BeaconSat, using the same Mark II Alpha launcher. The beacon sat is about the same mass, but it sacrifices some ancillary systems for additional fuel, giving it the delta V to meet the budget required out to a thousand kilometer LKO orbit. So if you remember, our satellites are designed with enough delta V in order to meet their entire budget from parking orbit into their final orbits, as well as a deorbit burn for disposal. However, there's still only a quarter of the mass of the payload that the Garnet launcher was designed for. So there's so much extra fuel on the Garnet launcher, might as well make Delta use of it and conduct the transfer with the final three, insertion stage. Two, and after staging, we'll switch to the debris briefly to make sure that the separatrons lower the periapsis enough in order for the stage, stage to deorbit properly. Roger stage. Once free of the Garnet launcher, BeaconSat-1 can insert itself into its final orbit. Insertion complete. Once we get the shape about right, we just do some very fine tuning for the semi major axis. So we get the apoapsis and periapsis exactly where we want them. We can do our final inclination checks by targeting Minimus itself, and we find that our orbital plane is off by a whopping 0.2 degrees, the correction for which is not even going to cost 6 meters per second. The change is so small we don't even have to worry about the maneuver nodes possibly speeding us up and messing with the AP or PE. Now contrast that 5.5 meter per second correction against what it would have cost if we went into an equatorial orbit at this altitude and we're just now doing a 6 degree inclination change to match up with Minimus. Quick, use the clock roll. 6 divided by 60 multiplied by our orbital speed on the nav ball. Finally, now that all the fiddling's been done, we can deploy the BeaconSat-1 so it can guide future flights towards Minimus. So I'm thinking that's not bad for one episode's worth of work. We've put three satellites in orbit, all within about a camel hair of their actual targets, and about 200% ahead on our Delta V budget. So I hope you had a nice refreshing drink from the fire hose. Now that you know all about maneuvering boards, you can draw out for yourself exactly why inclination changes are so expensive, about 10% for every 6 degrees.
so it pays huge dividends to do some quick planning or even some head cheese math to try and get your desired inclinations from the start and or have the patience to wait for the right launch timing. And keep in mind that there is sometimes no avoiding these changes, so make sure you have these formulas ready for when you're doing interplanetary transfers because at the speeds planets are moving around the sun, even small inclination changes amount to a significant amount of delta V. So if you've been paying attention at all during this episode, we should never see you launch on a 090 heading for a night flight to Minimus. Unless you have a really good excuse. Like a pit stop. Or lots of gas that you just want to burn. Scratch that, too much gas to burn, it's not a good enough excuse. So go pack some extra fuel, and we'll go forth and get unbent. This has been Purple Target at Crash and Learn. Peace out.